Do you think Jesus was smart? I'm not talking about like just smart as in knowing a lot of trivia or useless random facts, but like really smart, brilliant, genius-like, wise, the kind of person who sees what most folks don't, who thinks how most people don't think. Like, do you think Jesus lived on a different plane of existence? In AA and Al-Anon, folks talk about finding a sponsor in the program, a mentor, a guide to walk alongside as we work the steps. How do you choose someone to ask to be your sponsor? We always say, look for someone who has what you want. Does Jesus have something you want? Would he be a good guide and companion in your life? That kind of smart. Dallas Willard in his wonderful book, The Divine Conspiracy, very important book in my own spiritual journey from 20 years ago. He lamented that as he saw it, too many of us think of Jesus mainly as some sort of magical figure, a, a pawn or possibly a knight or a bishop in some religious game, someone whose teachings fit into one of two categories, things we have to say we believe or rules we have to follow, like we're assembling a magic formula to get the fairy tale ending we're after. Willard challenged people who want to follow Jesus to understand his teachings and life in a different light, more like information about reality. The earliest people who heard Jesus' message likely would not have experienced Jesus' teachings as a list of rules or dogma, but more as something so radically different and better than anything that had come before, they would conclude, they'd be fools to disregard it. You have the keys to eternal life, his friend Peter once said. Where else would we go? Because Jesus was smart, the smartest. At least I think so. I recall those paragraphs from Willard this week trying to di digest this harsh and difficult passage before us from the 14th chapter of the Gospel of Luke. Jesus is drawing what seems like a demanding and definitive line in the sand, a with me or against me sorting out of the people around him. And to many, I suspect, it feels like too much. A bridge too far, more like the radical demands of a cult leader or a wannabe dictator, less like the demands of the way to truth and life. Whoever comes to me and doesn't hate father and mother, spouse and children and brothers and sisters, yes, even one's own life cannot be my disciple. It's probably worth noting at this point that there's a good record in Scripture of Jesus having maintained his own family relationships throughout the rest of his life with his mother and his brothers. And while there are instances of disciples leaving their homes and loved ones behind to follow him, there isn't much evidence they hated their family members or held any ill will toward loved ones. So a strong case might be made that Jesus is speaking hyperbolically, magnifying or overstating the potential cost to make his point. On the other hand, some of our own experiences may show a cost like this whenever we step out in our own convictions of who we are or to follow our own path, even if it leads beyond the bounds of our communities of origin. For some of us, Jesus' call today may not seem 
that different from the path we've already been on in our lives. Relationships with those we love can be stretched or strained or even broken when we move beyond the terms of acceptance or belonging of family to explore and grow and become the best version of ourselves. But what about Jesus? What kind of claim is Jesus making in calling me and you to carry our own cross and to count the potential cost of following? Maybe a very high cost. Bishop Tom Wright offers an analogy to help us move forward in our understanding of this passage. He says, think of the leader of a great expedition forging a way through a high and dangerous mountain pass to bring urgent medical aid to villagers cut off from the rest of the world. If you wanna come any farther, the leader says, you'll have to leave your packs behind. From here on, the path is too steep to carry all this stuff. This is a dangerous route, and it's very likely that several of us won't make it back. So what might make this journey of following Jesus so dangerous? Well, just think of some of the things Jesus has been teaching as we've made our way through the Gospel of Luke. And think about how it might play out if we said it or lived it today. Like hanging out with the despised or oppressed people in society, making friends with IRS agents. Breaking the law to make sure folks can eat. Honoring poor folk and promising them the honored place in God's kingdom and in your own home. Challenging the rich and the comfortable those with an easy life. The list keeps going on and on. The list in Luke's gospel is the most extensive and perhaps the most challenging of all the gospel records. Remember the prayer Jesus gave, the one we pray each week. Say it out loud in the pub or tweet it out on your social media and see how this plays. Forgive us our debts. or continue to sanitize it as we do with the word trespasses. It's less socialistic that way. Thinking from earlier again now, do you think Jesus was smart? Very smart, brilliant, genius, wise, seeing what we don't see and knowing what we don't know and showing us how to live on a different plane of existence because Jesus having something we need and him showing us the way to a quality of life, to a higher plane of existence, to a meaningful and meaning-making life that we could not imagine or hope for or access if left to ourselves. This is how we start to understand the call to hold all our pre-existing attachments very loosely even the ones that matter most or that represent our strongest bonds? What might it take for us to embrace all the fullness of life that is available to us? And here's perhaps the most important part of it all. This life Jesus is showing us is not just for ourselves. The entire future of the world depends on us accepting the call and counting the cost because you and I, my siblings in Christ, are part of the plan. The next verse, the one we didn't read today, talks about the power of salt to season and flavor. It implies that our willingness to sign up, to buy in, to commit 100% to Jesus' way is what can impact this world and make it more and more like God's dream for all of us. You and I are the means through which Jesus will bring this life of goodness and healing into the world. If we'll count the cost and if we'll follow. So this day, 
I pray we might catch a glimpse of the promise, of the goodness, of the glory of this house that is being built, that we might pick up our cross and count the cost and follow wherever he leads. Amen.